what are some of the red flags that suggest a non-MSD myelating etiology in children versus adults? And how does that influence your initial workup? Right. Um, so how does MS present? Um, it's a, it presents as a subacute neurological symptom. By that, I mean it can occur within a couple of hours, but symptoms tend to be present for more than a couple of hours. They don't come and go away. In that case, we're thinking something more like a stroke, um, but they're persistent. They tend to be multifocal because of where the lesions are, multiple, sclerosis just. <laughs> uh, so the presentation is de usually dependent at that time on the inflammatory response. Uh, there's usually some edema, uh, so there's some mass effect. And they usually will, they're classical, symptoms that they can present with, sorry, purely based on uh, some of the areas that we think we know MS is attacks, mostly white matter. Um, so that would affect your eye. So optic neuritis can affect your spinal cord that can present with myelitis. Um, other many diseases can present the same way, but we want to make sure that their presentation meets that. Now, also how, what MS looks like mm -hmm. on imaging mm -hmm. has its own characteristics that's very different than many other diseases um, and it's hard to describe <laughs> but for those of us who do it I can just look at MRI and say that's that's a mess um, before having met the patient but um, and sorry was there a second part to the question how how different it is how does it influence the workup um, how what red flags suggest a non-MS demyelating etiology right. versus in, in children versus adults. Okay, so first describing how mm -hmm. MS presents. So first first things first is the clinical presentation. And it's, it's multifocal and it has to be more than one attack um, or a clinical presentation with the paraclinical features, whether on MRI and sometimes we use spinal uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Mm -hmm. um, main things for us you don't want to miss. So if a patient comes in with a fever and some, some demyelinating or neuroimmunological disorders, including ADEM, <laughs> uh, sorry, can present with a fever, but the fever almost always means infection, so let's make sure we're not missing meningitis. Uh, alteration in mental status, it's not something we see typically in multiple sclerosis. Again, the lesions, yes, uh, the, pre the symptoms come from where the lesions are and the inflammatory response. But at the same time, I don't, I don't expect a true cerebral inflammation that I see in encephalitis where a patient would come in altered and uh, confused and seizing and that's not a typical presentation for MS. Um, age group. So we, this is where the hormonal question had come in, but a MS diagnosis, for those of us who use a criteria <laughs> because mm. we don't have a biomarker, mm. there's a population, when I'm seeing a patient between the ages of 18 and 45, I can listen to this story and be able to tell them they have a MS, just purely based on clinical presentation in my exam. If I am seeing a five-year-old with the same exact story, I will never be able to make that diagnosis purely based on my exam mm. and clinical. Because it doesn't make sense in a five-year-old unless it's the only thing that makes sense. So there's a lot of exclusion um, of other things. I'm trying to think of other red flags. Um, and, and, and sometimes it's systemic illnesses that we don't know. Um, oh, one other thing I didn't want to miss, leukodystrophy and uh, I, w I would, sorry, genetic disorders of the immune system. Um, that now we know can also affect the brain, and they're usually intrinsic um, innate immune disorders. And sometimes, and this is where uh, genetic analysis becomes important, and these patients, by, by the time you're doing this, they haven't met diagnostic criteria for MS because they do, usually don't look like MS, but yeah, there's a lot of genetic um, mimics out there.